Hello, and welcome back to the Star Trek Critic, where we grade Trek episodes as if they were a school project and take away as many points as possible due to plot holes, continuity errors, and pretty much anything else. Today's episode is one of those not-to-be-missed fan favorites, The Squire of Gothos, where Kirk and crew encounter a bratty little omnipotent kid. The first point is lost for yet again another yeoman getting everyone coffee. Put in a coffee machine and get your own damn coffee. No one dreams of joining Starfleet just to get everyone coffee. The next point is lost thanks to Spock, who has no idea what a desert is. He is usually more knowledgeable about Earth terms. And isn't Vulcan just one big desert planet as well? This comment is foreshadowing. McCoy loses a point for his insulting comment towards Spock. When you binge watch these shows, his comments are a little too frequent. Spock notices something unusual. What the heck is a light warp? And there is the planet Gothos. So Beta 6 is 8 days away, and Kirk says they have no time to investigate. But previously, in the Galileo 7, they stopped to investigate a quasar while carrying medical supplies desperately needed to stop a plague. That's because there's no commissioner on the bridge this time for Kirk to piss off. There goes Sulu, and there goes Kirk. Unlike in the Galileo 7, Spock's command of this situation goes rather smoothly, and he has no problem in getting input from the rest of the bridge crew. And here you see how Spock comes to his conclusions and makes his decisions, totally the opposite from the Galileo 7. But in reality, the rescue team wouldn't be the pilot and co-pilot of the ship, so I will have to take a point. And I have to take another point here since they are beaming down onto a violent planet without spacesuits. Spock says to Activate, if you compare the two photos you can tell they aren't exactly in the same spots, and the silver box on McCoy has moved, as well as their oxygen cords, so I will have to take a point here. The Sal tries to contact the Enterprise with a giant turkey baster. It's really a bad idea to split up, there are only three of them, and really one of them should be aiming backwards so no one sneaks up from behind. Personally, I wouldn't mind having some of those tapestries hanging on the wall. McCoy, it's your girlfriend! So, Kirk and Sulu move a little bit and even blink here, but since Trelane isn't all perfect or all powerful, there's no guarantee that they're supposed to be completely frozen, so I can't take a point here. This door slams shut just like the one in Dark Shadows. Now we meet Trelane, who is so good at his role that I really can't take any points away. Also, since his view on Earth is 900 years outdated and not perfect, that will explain away any continuity errors with the props in the room. A viewing scope is probably some type of telescope. Kirk has no interest in staying, McCoy looks him over, and DeSalle is a little trigger happy. And there he goes again. And look what happened there, now Trelane has a phaser in his hand. And he just vaporized McCoy's girlfriend. Trelane describes his fancy holodeck machine slash 3D printer and gives Kirk a sample of what the planet is actually like. In this conversation you can see the differences in how Spock and Scotty communicate compared to Spock and McCoy. Bones constantly needles Spock about humanity and logic, while Scotty is much more scientific in nature. That's why earlier Spock kept Scotty on the ship and sent the doctor to the planet. Uh, while Trelane is only curious about human wars, Bones makes a discovery about him. The crew uses their observations to conclude that Trelane makes mistakes. Kirk makes a mistake by mentioning that there are women on the ship. Spock saves the day. That's track four. Let's get the hell out of here. Here is proof that people actually do take over on the bridge. Kirk loses a point here for using ounces and miles. He totally forgot about the metric system. McCoy's description is no help at all, but Trelane actually did follow them up to the ship. Now listen closely to this conversation. Trelane tells Kirk to punish Spock, but Kirk stands up for what Spock did. We'll get back to that later. Now Trelane brings the majority of the bridge crew back down to his castle. Sula only says one word here, but it really packs a punch. DeSalle's trigger happiness gets him frozen one more time. Here is where Kirk loses the biggest point in the show. Trelane refers to Ahura as a Nubian prize, no doubt. And Kirk also just says, no doubt, instead of standing up to Trelane like he did for Spock. He could have easily reminded Trelane he was 900 years behind the time, but he didn't, so minus one point. 
Spock really must not like Trelane. He can't even look at him when he says, I don't like you. There is no evidence Trelane knew Spock was half human, but I can't take a point this time since he might just be a good guessing smartass. This is an excellent transitional screenshot. McCoy makes an observation about the food, giving him and Spock a chance to bicker about logic and the word fascinating. While Trelane and Yeoman Ross dance, Kirk and Spock have ample time to discuss the mirror machine. Kirk challenges Trelane to a duel. And I will have to take a point away for the after commercial captain's log. None of us watching forgot what was going on in just two minutes. Luckily, Trelane has no idea how a duel works. And of course, Kirk should have shot at the mirror right when he got the gun. But he wanted the suspense, which could have gotten him killed. So he loses another point. Shouldn't Yeoman Ross's dress also disappear? Or is that just wishful thinking? Trelane throws his fit and disappears. But why does Kirk try to go after him? That's what she said. Back on the bridge, they try to escape. Uhura calls it Space Fleet Command. Even though they are desperate to get out of there, Kirk and Ross still have time to flirt. Sulu lets you know they are not yet traveling at warp speed, and then Kirk lets out a really big fart. They steer the ship by leaning to the left or to the right. Either Trelane can move Gothos into their path, or pull the Enterprise back. Despite what Sulu says, I think he is moving the Enterprise. Obviously, leaning back and forth does not break the ship free, so Kirk beams back down to the planet. This entire conversation is perfect. I was unable to take away any points. Spoiler alert, Kirk challenges Trelane to a hunt to save the ship. Trelane really doesn't understand this game. He didn't even count to 10. Shout out to Kirk for doing an excellent role, but it looks like he's just going from left to right and not away from Trelane. Kirk hides behind a plastic tree. That's what she said. It looks like he's holding in another fart. Trelane gives Kirk the first point, but Trelane is actually cheating. The second round ends with Kirk being fenced in, but he still manages to break Trelane's sword. Now Trelane's parents show up and tell him it's time to come home. Ironically, they call humans beings and superior, but still refer to them as pets also. And I'm sure every parent has heard one of these lines in one point of their life. These parents actually apologize to Captain Kirk and accept responsibility for their child's behavior. They are obviously not millennials. No, Kirk, talk into the communicator, not up to the sky. Since he's a little worn out, I can't take a point. Another cool screenshot. And here is where they lose the most points. Although the captioning says mischievous, both Kirk and Spock say mischievous, which is wrong, so they both lose points. Since I thought that was the correct way to say it until I learned it was wrong in my English class. And that's when I became a grammar Nazi. It's all their fault. Plus, Kirk loses another point for outdated pranks. Why didn't he just talk about the time he stole a car and drove it off a cliff when he was a kid? I saw that in a movie. So they end up losing three points right in a row. So who was on board the Enterprise today? Richard Carlyle went on to be the principal in the Brady Bunch. We will see Michael Barrier as DeSalle two more times. Vanita Wolf was in several shows and the cover girl for Playboy in July 1967. And William Campbell has over 80 acting credits. He enlisted in the Navy and was in the Pacific during World War II, sang with Elvis, and hobnobbed with nearly everyone in Hollywood. His performance of Trelane makes The Squire of Gothos one of the not to be missed episodes of all Trek, and we will see him again here as Koloth, and even again on Deep Space Nine. This episode goes down in history as one of the best Treks ever, and gets a score of 87%. Leave your comments below, specifically, what kind of a creature was Trelane? And where can I get good royalty-free space-themed music? Be sure to click that like button, the subscribe button, and share this video with your friends. Be sure to check out my other videos and playlists, and I will see you again real soon.